Excellencies, distinguished delegates, the meeting is called to order. Before I open the floor to the statement from delegates, I understand that our last speakers from this uh, morning panel was not able to deliver his views due to technical difficulty. I therefore would like to invite Ms. Saxena as moderator of the panel to take the floor. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, our last speaker was supposed to be Mr. Fatas, who's here online with us, so let me ask him. So Mr. Fatas, even before the pandemic, countries around the world had been on a path of accumulating more public debt. Asia and the Pacific is no exception. However, while developed countries were able to use unorthodox means to finance huge amounts of additional debt, most developing countries have found the lack of fiscal space the greatest handicap in their response to COVID-19. So what is your perspective on the outlook of the public debt challenge today, especially considering the scarring effects of the pandemic, which reduces future growth potentials? And are there policy options that developing countries could explore to free up some fiscal space while still maintaining fiscal and macroeconomic sustainability? Uh, the floor is yours, Mr. Fatas. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to, to this conference, but also apologies for the technical difficulties <laughs> before. Um, I, I just wanted to give sort of a, a context to what was happening before COVID, because I think it's important to understand where we are today. Uh, I mean, productivity growth in, in many emerging markets or low income economies was declining. Uh, there's a great book by some World Bank economies called Trends, Drivers and Policies on Global Productivity. Uh, and they documented how after the global financial crisis, we had seen a reduction in growth of, of emerging markets and low income countries. We had seen this low down in convergence. Mm -hmm. Some of it was the consequence of the global financial crisis. Uh, some of these were more structural issues that had to do with low investment in these countries. In addition, also before COVID-19, what we had is from a fiscal policy point of view, we had sort of creeping up debt levels among many governments in these countries. Part of it was that tax revenues, external finance had stagnated during those years. Part of it was sort of dealing with the consequences again of the global financial crisis. So in that environment of low growth and sort of slowly creeping up debt, we had a global pandemic. Now with the global pandemic, what did we learn? we learned that some countries have managed to get out of the pandemic quite fast. And of course, these are mostly advanced economies countries. They did suffer in some cases more than other countries during the crisis, but with a combination of two factors, they've managed to get out quite fast. And those two factors now are obvious to us. Number one is vaccines. Uh, vaccines have made a massive difference con controlling the health crisis. And number two is very large support by central banks, but in particular by governments. So if we look at government support during the crisis, as we all know well, advanced economies were the leader countries in the world. So we had this discretionary fiscal policy on average in advanced economies being about 24% of GDP, the, the sort of the type of stimulus packages we introduced in those countries. Well, if you go to emerging markets, the same number goes down to 6%, to low-income countries, we go down to 1.8%. So what is it that we've seen? We've seen these countries, the advanced economies getting out of the crisis fast, but the other countries, in particular, the low income countries, and to some extent, the emerging markets sort of lagging. And because they're lagging, their debts are increasing. They're increasing as a ratio to GDP. And for these countries, this is a lot more complicated than for advanced economies. And it's very interesting if we look at the last years, if you look at today, 2021, interest payments for advanced economies governments are, are lower than in the previous years, despite the fact that they've increased the debt dramatically. And that's of course because interest rates came down. At the same time, when you look at low income countries or emerging markets, that's not true. Interest payments are increasing and they're increasing as a combination of increased debt, but also in some cases, the spreads are increasing, interest rates faced by governments are increasing. So the IMF published the last fiscal policy monitor, I think it was this week or last week, the beginning of the end of last week. And if you look at their prediction for interest payments, if you look at the advanced economies, interest payments for advanced economies are going to remain around 5% of revenues of government revenues over the coming years. If you look at the low income countries, the same number might increase to 12 out to 12% and maybe it might be above 20% by 2026. 
So interest payment might represent, if we continue the current path, 20% of the tax revenues by governments. Of course, that number is unsustainable, which means we need to think uh, about new policies going forward. So let me highlight just to finish my, my comments, a, a couple of things that we need to think about in terms of policies. I'm gonna start with short-term policies and then I'm gonna follow with long-term solutions. Now in the short term, in the coming months or in the coming years, first thing, we need a global response to the health crisis. I don't think this is a surprise and many speakers before have mentioned that already. We need to speed up vaccinations across countries. We need countries to be able to implement smart policies to deal with future waves of the virus. I think we've learned something over the last years, over the last year and a half, that not all policies work in the same way. So as much as we can, we need a smart policies that contain, manage the health crisis without damaging the economy too much. When it comes to fiscal policy in the short run, we have to be selective. We need to support health. We need to support the weakest. We need to avoid cyclical scarring. We don't want this crisis to have, so to leave a long shadow in the long term. Now, so far, we know that it's going to, there's going to be some scarring which is going to be large in those countries, but as much as we can, we need to avoid that in the future. And final recommendation from a short run point of view, we're going to have to manage the liquidity shortages, the debt crisis that are coming in some countries and some economies in the years ahead. We need to strengthen the role of the IMF. We need to continue pushing initiatives like the debt service suspension initiative. Those two things have worked well so far, but we probably need a lot more going forward. And let me just make a final comment on long term solutions. I don't think we need to ignore those solutions because the long term at some point is going to come and it's going to bite us. We left the global financial crisis always thinking one day we're going to deal with the long term issues and we didn't have time to deal with them. And then we fell into another crisis. I need we need to be prepared for the next crisis, it's not just dealing with this one, but dealing with the next ones as well. We need to address the weakness in potential growth rates that we've seen now for years in these countries. Fiscal policy can help. Once again, we need to be selective and we need to find opportunities to support long-term growth. A few speakers have mentioned things like support for digitalization, support for the informal economy and its transformation. Those are things that fiscal policy could help and hopefully will leave potential growth in these economies. And then we need to create obviously a much better framework for fiscal policy going forward. I don't think I'm going to say anything which is surprising here. These are conversations we've had for years. We need better long-term planning for fiscal policy. We need a more efficient administration for taxes, transparency, reduction in tax concessions, strengthening the role of property taxes, increase the tax base in many countries, control the wage bill by governments, which is one of the elements which seems to be harder to control in many of these countries. And finally, we need to find a framework which provides the necessary credibility to avoid the constant movements in interest rates that we'll have to see in these countries. Then in the long run, if we want a stable funding for these governments and one that does not react much to this crisis, we need to have either the type of fiscal rules that provide that framework or any other credible framework that will help these countries navigate the future crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Fatas, for your intervention. I'm glad that you were able to make it. Uh, your comments are going to be very helpful as we deliberate on these issues. Now, let me give the floor back to, Mr. Uh, to our chair for interventions and statements from our member states. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Saxena. And thank you, Mr. Antonio Fatas, for your valuable contribution to our deliberation on this agenda item. I would now like to open the floor to statements from delegations. As we only have very limited time, may I ask all delegations to kindly keep your statement within four minutes. This morning session, sorry, this afternoon will be less until the four o'clock. For your information, the speaking order will be statement from the SCAP member state, followed by associate member, permanent observer, followed by statement from designated representative of UN bodies and specialized agencies and intergovernmental organizations, and followed by statement from representative of non-governmental organization, if time permit. Statement will be read in the order in which they have been received by the conference officer 
or show up in the request speak list. I would like to invite the first speaker on the list, distinguished delegation from Nepal, and then followed by Bangladesh. So the, the, the first speaker will be from Bangladesh, and then followed by the distinguished delegate from China. Bangladesh, the floor is yours. Excellencies, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen. I sincerely thank the UNSCAP for organizing this timely regional discussion, especially at the time when countries around the world are struggling with managing economic growth, which has been critically affected due to the outbreak and continuation of COVID-19 pandemic. Excellencies, our father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, had a dream of building a nation free from poverty. Under the dynamic leadership and dedication of his daughter, Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, we are rapidly moving towards the fulfillment of Bangabandhu's dream. With her visionary plan and, combination and commitment for inclusive development, policy in poverty reduction, we have made commendable progress in poverty reduction. It is evident that the rate of poverty has been reduced from 56.7% in fiscal year 1992 to 20.5% in fiscal year 2019. And the rate of extreme poverty has also decreased to 10.5% from 41.1% during the same period. The government has set priority and is continuously widening number of beneficiaries and increasingly allocating resources for inclusive growth. 125 social protection programs are now being administered and the number of beneficiaries increased from 9.8 million in, in 2011 to 40.68 million in fiscal year 2021. Excellencies, with a view to tackling the COVID-19 pandemic and overcome its potential adverse effects on the country, on the economy, the government has announced a comprehensive stimulus and economic recovery package to the tune of US dollar 23 million billion or above 6.3% of GDP. We have offered 28 schemes under the package, among which noteworthy schemes are supporting emergency healthcare services, protecting jobs and achieving a smooth economic recovery interest subsidies to industrial and service sectors, direct cash transfer to ultra poor, food aid to uh, unemployed people, widen, widening social safety net program for the ultra poor, credit guarantee schemes for cottage micro and small uh, enterprises. Steps has also been undertaking to revitalizing the rural economy and job creation in rural area. Government took all the efforts to take well, well care of every sector and ensured, the, ensured that no agri field leave unplowed. Because of prompt and timely adopted initiatives of government, Bangladesh has managed relatively well acuteness of the pandemic and its impacts on economy and society. This is reflected as Bangladesh achieved GDP growth of 3.52% in 2020 and 5.47% in 2021, when many countries experienced negative GDP growth rate. This growth feature is backed by the recovery of domestic consumptions, fueled partly by remittances from abroad, stimulus and social protection packages and pragmatism to continue the economic activities. Ladies and gentlemen, we strongly recognize that the experience during the pandemic, however, will give an opportunity to reflect on key development 
and innovative strategies and see how this can be recalibrated to deliver a more inclusive, resilient, and sustainable future. We hope ultimately it will help strengthen regional and multilateral cooperation in development approaches. Thank you all. Thank you. And now I invite distinguished delegates from China and followed by distinguished delegate from Sri Lanka. China, the floor is yours.主席先生各位代表当年当前百年变局和世界疫情交织影响世界经济脆弱复苏可持续发展进程面临严峻的挑战亚太是世界经济增长的主引擎早日战胜疫情恢复经济增长是亚太国家的主要任务各方应加强团
中国坚持绿色发展，力争二零三零年前实现碳达峰，二零六零年前实现碳中和。中国践行疫苗作为全球公共产品的承诺，全年将对外推提供二十亿剂疫苗。在向新冠疫苗实施计划捐助一亿美元基础上，中国今年还将再向发展中国家无偿捐助一亿剂疫苗。主席先生，不久前。习近平主席在出席第七十六届联大一般性辩论时，郑重提出全球发展倡议，呼吁国际社会加快落实二零三零年可持续发展议程，推动实现更加强劲、绿色、健康的全球发展，构建全球发展命运共同体。全球发全球发展倡议同二零三零年可持续发展议程相适应。契合各国，特别是发展中国家的发展需要，我们欢迎亚太国家加入这一倡议，携手推进亚太可持续发展和疫后更好重建。谢谢。Thank you, distinguished delegates from China. I apologize for reading the wrong list. On the the next speaker will be distinguished delegate from Nepal. The floor is yours. Can I speak now? Is it audible? Yes, please. Mr. Chairman, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, Ladies and Gentlemen, Good afternoon. First of all, on behalf of the Netherlands delegation and my own, I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to the UN SCAP for organizing this important session. Nepal is currently implementing 15th development plan from the year 2019 to 2024. This plan has been aligned with the sustainable development goals. The plan has targeted to achieve the economic growth rate on an average 9.6% per annum to reduce absolute and multidimensional poverty to 9.5% and 11.5% respectively by the year 2024. Nepal has been implementing various poverty reduction programs such as providing various subsidies and incentives to the poor household, Prime Minister Employment Program, Multi-Sectoral Nutrition Program, and Social Security Programs, among others. As a result, we have been able to reduce the absolute and multidimensional poverty to 18.7 and 17.4 percent respectively in 2019. However, the recent COVID-19 pandemic has negatively impacted on our efforts to poverty reduction and our hard on development gains. Mr. Chairman, Nepal has achieved significant economic growth rate of 7.4 percent over the past three years before the outbreak of COVID-19. Due to the pandemic, Nepal experienced negative growth rate of 2% in 2020. However, it is expected to grow by 7% this year. Similarly, per capita GNI has increased to US dollar 1,196 in 2020 from US dollar 877 in 2015. In order to realize the set development targets, Nepal needs to manage adequate development financing. For this, Government has emphasized on increasing domestic resource mobilization and attracting more domestic and foreign investment. In order to meet the funding gap, we need increased international support, including blended and innovative financing and regional and global partnership to achieve national development goals, including SDG. Mr. Chairman, the government has been implementing various support programs for the speedy recovery of severely hit economy by the COVID-19 pandemic. Those programs are targeted to stimulate economy, create employment opportunity through fiscal, monetary, and other sectoral policies and programs. We are of the view that fast, effective, equitable, and affordable vaccine would only be an ultimate tool to fight against this COVID-19 pandemic. We call on the international community to collaborate in making the vaccine a global public goods and support on critical health infrastructure of LDC so as to develop resilient public health system to tackle future pandemics. 
Nepal is graduating from LDC, which will have several consequences on trade, official development assistance, and other international support measures. The government of Nepal is preparing a graduation strategy for smooth, sustainable, and irreversible graduation. Finally, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the development partners for their continued support in our development efforts and minimizing the impact of COVID-19. I thank you, Chair. Thank you, distinguished delegates from Nepal. And now I invite this distinguished delegate from the Philippines. The floor is yours. Excellencies, government representatives, delegates, good afternoon. Unlike previous tax reforms that were a reaction to crisis or impending crisis, the various packages of the comprehensive tax reform program in the Philippines that we, we proposed in 2016 were meant to address both equity and efficiency issues. That is, the incremental tax collections were meant to finance much needed infrastructure investments and socioeconomic programs such as education, health, and social protection. An important component of the tax reform was the increase in excise taxes on sin products to finance our universal health care program. The universal health care program, of course, complements our existing con conditional cash transfer program, which we institutionalized through a statute just before the pandemic struck. Covering approximately 4 million households, the CCT is both a poverty reduction strategy and a human capital investment program. We also increased excises on petroleum products and sugar sweetened beverages in, a, in addition to implementing technology-driven tax administration measures. Upon its completion, the CTRP is expected to generate additional two percentage points for our tax effort. To complement additional taxes, we continue to tap official development assistance and encourage PPP for infrastructure development. Since then, disbursements for infrastructure rose substantially, breaching 5% of GDP in 2019, and we intend to keep this ratio in the years to come. That we intend to maintain our infrastructure spending at about 5% of GDP effectively communicates that any fiscal consolidation will not be premature or abrupt. In a way, therefore, the pandemic found the Philippines with fiscal space with which to help finance measures to combat the virus and, and programs already well in place, such as, the, such as the conditional cash transfer, universal health care, and the infrastructure program. These programs will continue to play an important role even after the pandemic. And we expect the private sector to assume a greater responsibility. We have designed our infrastructure programs to be hybrid such that the public sector finances the construction, while the private sector takes on operations, maintenance, and management phase of the project. The private sector is active in our public-private partnership program for infrastructure development and in other social undertakings. By the end of 2021, PPPs would have generated close to 40 billion US dollars in additional funding for 30 big infrastructure projects. Our microfinance program is also private sector led and has played a crucial role in the development of our micro insurance market. In the aftermath of Typhoon Haiyan in 2013, more than 100,000 micro insurance claims were processed and about half a billion pesos or US dollar 10 million were disbursed. As of today, the microinsurance micro covers 50 million poor people, over 56% of the population. Sustainable finance is about the sustainability of financing itself and the enhancement of sustainability as a result of the investment. The Philippines has practiced fiscal discipline and lived within its means, building strategic fiscal space, which has been recently put to use it has also explored innovative financing such as PPPs in infrastructure development 
and help mobilize private sector resources for social transformation, as in the case of microfinance and microinsurance. The pressing issue at hand is climate change, which has dire economic consequences, but it is the poorer nations and poorer households who will bear much of the brunt. We could take out loans to procure va vaccines, which the Philippines did, but there is no vaccine for a climate change. The Philippines takes this opportunity to call for equity in the access to COVID-19 vaccines and urges privileged partners to fully support the COVAX facility and further strengthen our cooperation mechanisms. We could say by way of parallelism that green finance or climate financing is in a way or two similar to the CCT program. The CCT seeks to invest in the healthcare of both mother and child especially in the child's formative years, to prevent irreversible damage to child's health and development. Similarly, green finance promotes investments that prevent inflicting irreversible, irreversible damage to our earth. Moreover, much of the 75% greenhouse gas emission reduction and avoidance target of the Philippines by 2030 is conditional upon the support of climate finance technologies and capacity development, which shall be prov provided by developed economies as pres prescribed by the Paris Agreement. The Philippines has already taken steps to contribute in fighting climate change. The first package of the aforementioned CTRP, for instance, re raised excises on petroleum products. Our energy department also declared moratorium on new coal plant projects. Today at 3 p.m. Bank of Time, we are launching the Philippine Sustainable Finance Roadmap and Guiding Principles. Said roadmap rests on three pillars, policy, creating a conducive environment, financing, mainstreaming sustainable finance, and investment promoting a sustainable pipeline. Thank you very much. Thank you, distinguished delegate from the Philippines. And now I invite distinguished delegate from Myanmar. You have the floor, sir. Mr. Chairman, Ms. Amidur Saucier Alice Pagana, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to uh, a very good afternoon to you all and Minglava. Greetings from Myanmar. It is a great pleasure for me to deliver the statement in this important section of the Committee on Macroeconomic Policy, Poverty Reduction, and Financing for Development. I wish to express my sincere appreciation to UNSCAP for inviting us and thank you for the best efforts to hold this meeting during this challenging time. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, when the world struggles with the COVID-19 pandemic, countries are also continuing to focus on development challenges like reducing poverty, creating jobs, and pursuing sustainable development. These challenges may enclose to achieve Sustainable Development Goals, SDG of 2000 2030 agenda. The important lesson during this period is cross-sectorial thinking on the actions and implementation approach. We are necessary to focus on the current policies and related implementations that we can make prioritizing action to manage issues to be in line with the new normal situation. Ladies and gentlemen, Regarding the COVID-19, the government of Myanmar is making the multiple measures to address and alleviate the adverse effects of COVID-19 pandemic. We all know that while countries prioritize speedy economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, financial flows are critical for not to divert away from the SDGs and build back better for enhancing the resilience of their economies. In this regard, I would like to briefly touch upon the government's efforts towards an inclusive, 
resilient and sustainable economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, Myanmar is undertaking a two prolonged approach consisting of performing the preventive and control measures and facilitating access to remedy for the economy affected by the pandemic and added speed and possible ways. To remedy the economy affected by the COVID-19, Myanmar Economic Recovery Plan, MERP, which is in line with the other regional plans, will be launched very soon. To mitigate the inevitable economic impact caused by COVID-19, we are making efforts through not only supporting financial stimulus, regulatory stimulus, by streamlining procedures and easing the rules and regulations, but also providing financial stimulus by the establishment of the special fund for the business sectors. NIMA has begun disbursing loans and assistance to local businesses and rice exporters as part of immediate relief measures amid coordinated economic support uh, to disrupt the economy and access to foreign aid, investment, and international trade and to shake confidence in the local banking sector. Since the third wave of the COVID-19 is spreading in Myanmar, like other world nations, we are making our utmost efforts in carrying out the prevention, control, and treatment activities in collaboration with the people. The government is also undertaking to access the essential medical supplies. A plan was adopted to complete vaccination for 50% of the people above 18 years at the end of the December 2021 and 70% in mid-2022. No matter how we are having many challenges, we will strive to overcome the various difficulties and hindrances. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, the government of Myanmar has announced the five wide roadmaps and nine objectives to be carried out for the future actions since February 2021. Myanmar Sustainable Development Plan, MSDB, from 2018 to 2030, has also been implemented since 2018. MSDB's long-term vision and intended to, in to be inclusive and balanced development aligned with SDGs and various regional commitments. NIMA will continue to implement the SDGs and also all commitments agreed uh, in the Asia-Pacific region, uh, including GMS Strategy 2030, GMS COVID-19 Recovery Plan and ASEAN Com Com Comprehensive uh, Re Re Recovery Framework, ACRF. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, we also would like to highlight that digital technology plays a crucial role in pandemic prevention and control and boosting economy. We need to strengthen cooperation on technology and innovation, promote the development of digital economy and advance in new industries and new business models to spur the economic recovery of the UNSCAP member countries while leaving no one behind and cooperation are very critical. So committee is requested to review the innovative and digital financing strategies and discuss good practices and challenges in their deployment in their region. We also request to provide guidance to the Secretariat on how it can support member states through technical assistance. During this critical moment of tackling with Distinguished 
delegate since there is a problem in connections. So I would like to continue to the next speaker that will be distinguished delegate from Sri Lanka. The floor is yours. Mr. Chairman, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to you all. It's a great privilege to join this virtual meeting during this challenging time of crisis, resilience and recovery. Today, I will briefly discuss Sri Lanka's response to the coronavirus pandemic, along with key policy priorities that can help to achieve a strong, inclusive, sustainable recovery and especially effective path for the achievement of the 2030 agenda. The COVID-19 has become a global pandemic, which is defining health and economic crisis of our time. With the first domestic cases of COVID-19 reported in March 2020, the government rapidly scaled up control measures. Due to the, those measures, combined with rigorous case findings, contact tracing, and as well as quarantine and isolation, ensured that first wave was contained successfully. The second wave of infections and rapid increase of cases were reported during the last quarter of 2020, but the second wave was also kept under control. The country is now under the influence of third wave of COVID-19 infections, and the government has successfully managed to control the infections and fatalities due to the pandemic, mainly from the implementation of full-fledged vaccination program together with island-wide lockdowns. As of today, the government has managed to get almost 58% of the population fully vaccinated and about 70% with at least one dose, in spite of having limited fiscal space in the country. Aforementioned vaccinated numbers can be kept on par with any other country with highest levels in their vaccination program. Not only are we in process of administering the vaccines to children from ages 12, but also the third dose. The success of those actions are evident as daily new infections that was high as around 5,000 in August has now reduced to around 670, while deaths, which although was around 200 per day during the August, has now reduced to 20, with a recovery rate of almost 92.8%, while the death rate was only 2.5%, and the total infection were only 529,755, the toll on the economy in particular is significant. However, proactive measures other than vaccination taken by the government, including suspension of tourist arrivals, imposing island-wide curfew and lockdowns were hit uh, sectors like tourism, construction, and transport especially hard while collapsing global demand affected the textile industry. Job and earning losses disrupted private consumption and uncertainty impeded investment. Despite of this difficult situation, the government spent an estimated 0.7% GDP in cash transfers to displaced daily workers, affected senior citizens, persons with a disability, and kidney patients, among others. And these measures help and soften the impact of crises on poverty. At present, the government are attempting to absorb the shocks by providing a wide range of fiscal and monetary stimulus. We have granted tax reliefs and also introduced debt moratoria to ease the burden on domestic businesses and individuals. Despite of the fact that the pandemic has hit harder during the 2021, Sri Lankan economy has indicated impressive signs of fast recovery of the economy devastated by the pandemic, with GDP growth 4.3% in first quarter of 2021, and especially 12.3% in the second quarter. If the global economy recovers faster than expected and the global tourism industry rebounds more quickly, 
with the progress on global vaccination program, the growth outlook could, be, could become more favorable. However, we expect to be back on track soon by vaccinating majority of the population and move forward in 2022 with a new approach to expedite the progress in 2030 agenda. Sri Lanka can work secure fiscal and debt sustainability and drive resilient growth and jobs, particularly a focus on the blue and green economy and on smart agriculture, allowing productive local companies to integrate into global value chains and attaining higher value addition in the manufacturing, agribusiness and service sectors. Further development strategies and sustainability indicators should be changed accordingly to be in line with the global new normal conditions and the economic recovery needs to be measured and evaluated incorporating the new variables included due to the post pandemic global conditions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Distinguished delegates, as we are already beyond allocated time, may I ask all delegations once again to kindly keep your statement within four minutes. And now I invite distinguished delegates from Japan. The floor is yours. Thank you, Chair, for giving, giving me a floor. Am I audible? Please. Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, we would like to thank the Secretariat for organizing uh, uh, important panel discussion. We had uh, insightful input from participants from Cambodia, India, ADB, and Mr. Fattis. We also appreciate uh, China and Uzbekistan for organizing very important side event in the lunch break. Uh, we had also uh, insightful and useful input on poverty reduction. We would like to briefly share Japan's contribution to equitable access to COVID-19 vaccine and debt relief measure. COVID-19 pandemic has had a huge socioeconomic impact on the Asia and Pacific region. To alleviate the shock caused by the pandemic, Japan has pledged 1 billion US dollars of financial assistance to COVAX facility and has provided over 25 million doses of vaccine across the globe, bilaterally or through COVAX facility, including over 11 million doses of vaccine to the ASEAN countries. Government of Japan has also agreed with the Islamic Republic of Pakistan the Federal Democratic Republic of Nepal, the Republic of Maldives, and the independent state of Samoa on the debt relief measures to follow the debt service suspension initiative, which, has, which was announced at the G20 financial ministers and central bank governors meeting on April 25th, 2020. Mr. Chair, a distinguished delegate, Japan will enhance such cooperation in the region to normalize and energize social and economic activity. Thank you very much. Thank you, distinguished delegate from Japan. And now I would like to invite distinguished delegate from Russian Federation. You have the floor, sir. Обсуждая сегодня проблемы экономического развития региона и стремясь найти наиболее адекватные, эффективные способы их преодоления, мы, разумеется, не можем вести дискуссию в отрыве от фактора пандемии COVID-19, которая продолжает держать в тисках весь мир. Замедление деловой активности, разрыв глобальных производственных цепочек, напряжение в социальной сфере. Все это нанесет серьезный удар по мировой экономике. К сожалению, как показывает практика, 
не все могут удержаться от соблазна действовать по принципу «каждый за себя». Поэтому стратегической задачей мы считаем обеспечение согласованности действий государств членов эскада в области восстановления после пандемии коронавирусной инфекции. Следует иметь в виду, что пандемия нанесла не одинаковый ущерб разным странам. В этой связи важно обеспечить комплексный подход к макроэкономической стабилизации который учитывал бы специфику отдельных субрегионов и групп стран, особенно наименее развитых. Столь масштабная задача требует разработки целевых решений по ряду вопросов. Упрощение частного инвестирования в проекты государственного значения, открытие цифровизации, облегчение долгового времени, совершенствование систем налогообложения и борьба с уклонением от оплаты налогов. Все это позволит минимизировать последствия нынешнего кризиса и повысить устойчивость как экономик отдельных стран, так и всего региона. Среди рассматриваемых экспертным сообществом мер после ковидного восстановления есть целый ряд инновационных подходов. Мы их отметили. Например, использование адресных облигаций. Думается, что прежде чем переходить к широкому использованию таких инновационных рецептов, требуется детальный анализ всех аспектов данной идеи. Собственно, финансовых, организационных, политических. То же касается и учета расходов на борьбу с изменением климата в счет погашения долга. А имеющиеся в этом предложении, в том числе относительно различных типов долговых свопов, целесообразно представляется решать системно в рамках общего рассмотрения проблематики содействия международному развитию и облегчения долгового времени развивающихся, особенно наименее развитых стран. В контексте выполнения развитыми странами своих обязательств по выделению развивающимся странам финансирование на климатические цели. А, господин председатель, в рамках нашей сегодняшней дискуссии хотели бы поделиться своим опытом, который может быть полезным заинтересованным государственным членам для выстраивания стратегии инклюзивного экономического восстановления. С самого начала пандемии Российская Федерация незамедлительно приступила к разработке и реализации разноплановых мер, направленных на то, чтобы минимизировать шоковое воздействие COVID-19 на социально-экономическую систему страны. В первую очередь акцент был сделан на обеспечении прорывных решений в сфере здравоохранения. Как известно, Россия первой в мире создала вакцину против COVID-19, спутник ВИ доказала ее безопасность и клиническую эффективность. Применение данного препарата одобрено уже в 69 странах, а производство налажено в 14, и в том числе в государствах нашего региона – Китай, Индия, Южная Корея, Казахстан, Турция, Вьетнам. А это было подчеркнуть непреложную, непреложную истину. В сфере борьбы с глобальными инфекциями не должно быть вместо инфекционизма и своекорыстным политически мотивированным подходом. А немного об опыте нашей страны в отношении поддержки собственного населения и бизнеса. А меры принимались в самых разных областях. Вот подходы пенсионерам и малолетними детьми и невысокими доходами до предоставления льготных ипотек, продления кредитных каникул, бесплатного переобучения безработных. Особое внимание было уделено поддержке одной из наиболее уязвимых групп населения – трудовых мигрантов. Увлечение миграционного законодательства, бесплатное оказание медицинской помощи и вакцинации – это также было в пакете мер. 
искренне понимаю, что пандемия сильнее всего ударила именно по малым и средним предприятиям, руководство страны реализовало программу поддержки бизнеса, адресно нацеленную именно на эти категории предпринимательской деятельности. Компании в пострадавших отраслях получили налоговые каникулы и субсидии, безвозмездные гранты и доступ к программе льготного кредитования. Всего на финансирование перечисленных выше мер с начала кризиса было выделено 2,6% ВВП. В заключение, господин председатель. Пандемия, несомненно, стала очередной проверкой Института макроэкономической политики Азиатско-Тихоокеанского региона, да и всего мира, на прочность. Мы твердо выступаем за то, чтобы искато оставался основным координирующим механизмом многостороннего сотрудничества в интересах эффективного решения общих для стран проблем в сфере макроэкономики, борьбы с нищетой, финансирование развития. Нет. Необходим совместный поиск новых точек роста, способных помочь преодолеть всеобщий спад. Исходя из неделимости безопасности во всех ее измерениях, в первую очередь в специально-экономическом отношении, мы со своей стороны готовы к конструктивному взаимодействию с партнерами по эскату для скорейшего преодоления кризиса и выводы экономик государств региона на траекторию поступательного устойчивого развития. Спасибо. Thank you very much, distinguished delegate from Russian Federation. And now I invite distinguished delegate from India. India, the floor is yours. Mr. Chair and distinguished delegates, we would take this opportunity to place our appreciation on record for the comprehensive technical notes prepared by UNISCAP Secretariat. Post-COVID, India's economic recovery has gained momentum in the recent months, enthused by ebbing of the second wave, fast-paced vaccinations, and enhanced mobility, which is currently at around 90% of pre-pandemic levels. India's vaccination drive continues to set new milestones with more than 986.8 million cumulative doses administered so far, the second highest among all countries. As on 19th October 2021, more than 80% of India's adult population has received at least one dose of vaccination, while more than 33% has been administered both doses. The national income data for April to June quarter that is quarter one of the current fiscal year, reaffirms India's resilient V-shaped recovery despite a, despite a more brutal second wave. The momentum of India's economic recovery witnessed since second half of FY 2020-21 did get disrupted by the second wave. However, the rapid surge in vaccination coverage from 6.4% of the adult population with at least first dose at end March 2021 to more than 80% now. The latest figures up to 19th October uh, 2021 contains the sequential decline in output. Government of India has introduced a number of measures to boost investment and support broad-based and inclusive economic development to help the post-pandemic recovery. Every policy which was introduced also had some structural component, structural reform component complementing the policy. Key structural reforms like deregulation of the agricultural sector, change in definition of MSMEs, new public sector undertaking policy, commercialization of coal mining, higher FDI limits in defense and space sector, development of land bank and industrial information system, revamp of viability gap funding scheme for social infrastructure and a new power tariff policy have a significant impact on the recovery process which India is currently witnessing. Mr. Chair, 
India's endeavor is to ensure a robust growth and a sustainable development path while combating the climate change risks on best effort basis. India's per capita emission of greenhouse gases is quite low as compared to other developed countries. India has taken a number of initiatives on both mitigation and adaptation strategies with emphasis on clean and efficient energy system, resilient urban infrastructure, water conservation and preservation, safe and smart sustainable green transportation network, planned afforestation, as well as by supporting various sectors such as agriculture, forestry, coastal and low-lying systems and disaster management. India also remains steadfast in its commitments to join and lead efforts to combat climate change within the multilaterally agreed conventions and its Paris Agreement. International Solar Alliance and Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure are evidence of India's various actions at the international, serious actions at the international level. It is noteworthy that regional initiatives are an important aspect of India's international economic initiatives. However, such initiatives must be based on universally recognized international norms, good governance, rule of law, openness, transparency, and equality. They must follow principles of financial responsibility. India's proactive climate actions mainly rely on domestic budgetary resources. Climate finance is thus indeed critical to fulfill the execution of NDC targets submitted by India in a timely manner. Climate finance is an obligation of the developed countries as a part of their historical responsibility as they were the major contributors to the stock of greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere accumulated since the Industrial Revolution. The lack of acquired momentum in the SOAP scale and speed of climate finance from developed to developing countries needs to be addressed. The enhanced new and additional financial resources, technological support, and the support in capacity building should be mobilized and delivered to strengthen the ongoing climate actions in developing nations like India. The section on supporting the transition towards the green economy in the note rightly emphasizes the role of public finance and climate change actions towards mitigation and adaptation. However, it does not include any references to the financial and technological support to developing countries from developed countries for climate actions, which has been agreed to under the Paris Agreement. The agenda note puts forth fiscal policy options to help secure public buy-in, financial compensation for affected households and economic sectors in the form of either a lump sum rebate, income tax credits, or social welfare benefits, and also through clearly communicating with the public about the purpose that the remainder of the carbon tax revenue will serve, such as, do in, such as incentivizing green technologies and innovations. These policy suggestions might be appropriate for developed economies. However, they are unsuitable for developing economies since they fail to take into account the fiscal stress of such policies on developing country governments, already woefully short of financial resources for climate mitigation and adaptation. Nevertheless, Government of India is providing financial compensation for the COVID-affected fam families. It is also not appropriate to compare the stringency of greenhouse gas emission mitigation policies across developed and developing countries, given their diversity, both in terms of the level of development and the responsibility they owe due to past emissions. The Paris Agreement talks of global peaking of greenhouse, emission, greenhouse gas emissions by second half of this century, with developed countries taking the lead and recognizing that developing countries will take some more time. Thus, a common carbon price floor assumes away, the, that assumes away the diversity among countries, especially the deep wedge between developed and developing countries, and is contrary to the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities, the bedrock of Paris Agreement. Mr. Chair, while conceptualizing fiscal incentives for green private investment, it may be noted that in addition to using public procurement as a tool in the transition towards 
green economy, governments can also have at their disposal fiscal incentives to promote green investment by the private sector. Examples of these incentives include reduced or zero corporate income tax rates, exemptions for exemptions for in exemptions from indirect taxes such as import duties, investment allowances, and tax credits, and accelerated depreciation of capital goods. In this regard, however, it is important to avoid incentivizing activities that would anyway have been carried out regardless and avoid guiding markets to adopt less than optimal green technologies. We would like to mention that while green public procurement must be mandated in developed countries on account of the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities, there are limitations to expand this coverage in developing countries. The respective section in the note does not take into account the fiscal implications of green procurement on developing economies and transition support required by economic sectors towards lower carbon pathways. Moreover, given that this agenda note discusses post-COVID recovery, this particular topic has the potential to exacerbate the debt crisis faced by several developing economies. Thank you. Thank you, distinguished delegate from India, and now I invite distinguished delegates from Pakistan. You have the floor. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, good afternoon, Swadika, and assalamu alaikum. First of all, let me congratulate you for brilliantly steering these deliberations and also our deepest appreciation uh, to the ASCAP committee uh, for the hard work they've done to make this very valued discussion possible. Excellency, I will not repeat what my minister said earlier this morning about our GDP growth, tax reform, SDGs, microfinancing, uh, green uh, financing, sustainable economic development, and regional initiatives. Therefore, please allow me to primarily focus on our battle against the pandemic in line with the UN concept of sharing best practices. Like other countries in the region, Pakistan was also hit hard by the pandemic. We, however, were able to save and salvage our economy to a greater extent due to something called smart lockdowns. While Pakistan and the rest of the world scratched their head over the question, the million dollar question, to open or not to open the economy, Pakistan quickly made a very bold and rather interesting move to open the economy and enforced smart lockdowns. As the name suggests, it's been quite smart, really. Lockdown, COVID hotspots, and let the rest of the region follow the standard operating procedures. Allow me today, Excellency, Mr. Chairman, to mention two very scary international studies and reports against Pakistan. One, an Imperial College London study of last year, June 2020, indicated that Pakistan could hit 13.6 million infections by the end of 2020 and 80,000 deaths by August 2020. This is last year if it failed to fully lock down. A Wall Street Journal report, 1st August, 19, 1st August 2020, described Pakistan as a coronavirus bright spot. This was new to us because at that time, and even today, we're talking of hot spot. But the Wall Street Journal chose to say bright spot was quoted extensively. Mr. Chairman, Despite having the fifth highest population in the world, this has been a remarkable turnout despite the gory predictions 
on the awful toll that the virus may have had. I'm happy to report to ASCAP, Alhamdulillah, our deaths fortunately do not stand at 80,000 as predicted and has been controlled as of today to 28,306. As you may be aware, the United Nations has also lauded Pakistan's declining numbers. Today, I will not just thump my chest by saying, oh, we've tackled this. The staggering plunge in Pakistan's COVID-19, Mr. Chairman, has puzzled one and all, including international health experts. As far as the reasons behind this decrease in cases is concerned, it could be mainly due to the following. And that is why I am today sharing these best practices with the United Nations. Three points. One, there was a presence of a non-specific immunity that is unique to Pakistan because people take multiple vaccines. So there's multiple exposure to vaccines right from childhood, may it be the BCG or the oral polio vaccine right from childhood. This could have been a contributing factor. The second most important thing that in Pakistan we have a youth bulge. And let me explain it to you in figures. 63% of Pakistan is between the age of 15 and 33. Therefore, a high level of immunity. The third thing could have been high humidity in the monsoon season and a low transmission rate in the peak summer season could have been one of the factors. I must also confess that while Pakistan may have won a couple of battles, the war against this pandemic is far from over. Keeping the economy afloat while steering the country through this critical time is no mean feat. But winter is coming. Winter is coming and with it, the virus season. So what can Pakistan and other countries, under the advice of the United Nations, the ASCAP, especially the developing countries, do to ensure survival and turn around our economies and turn our tales of misfortune into a happily ever after. I think Rudyard Kipling had the answer when he said, and let me quote, Rudyard said, now this is the law of the jungle, as old and as true as the sky, and the wolf that shall keep it may prosper, and the wolf that shall break, it may die, as the creepers that bridles the tree trunk, the law runneth forward and back, for the strength of the pack is the wolf, and the strength of the wolf is the pack. Maybe Rudyard Kipling was basically emphasizing the crucial importance of cooperation and discipline in the society by detailing the rights and responsibilities of the wolf pack, which in our case, as our Chinese delegate said earlier, is multilateralism and only multilateralism. Mr. Chairman, Poetry aside, in the end, Pakistan would like to request the Secretariat to continue with its valued research and support all of us 
through their vital technical assistance and sustained capacity building in transforming our economies towards inclusive, common, resilient, and sustained pathways. Come, come. Thank you. Are there any other distinguished delegate wish to take the floor? I see none. The floor is now open to designate representative of UN bodies and specialized agencies and international organizations. Are there any UN bodies, specialized agencies, intergovernmental organizations who wish to, to speak? I see none. The floor is now open to designate it representative of civil society, organization, and other entities. Are there any entities who wish to take the floor? I see none. So thank you very much. This concludes our discussions on agenda item two. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, it is now my honor to invite His Excellency, Mr. Fiara Kim, Deputy Secretary General, National Committee for ESCAP, Royal Government of Cambodia, the Vice Chair of the Association of the Committee on Macroeconomic Policy, Property Reductions and Financing for Development to conduct the meeting from this point forward. Excellencies. Good afternoon, um, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, before we proceed with the agenda three, I would like to invite the secretary to provide some housekeeping announcement. So uh, please, uh, Ms. Nexis. Um, may I provide some quick reminders for the delegates, participants joining us via the e-conferencing platform Kudo. To select the preferred UN language, the language selector with drop-down menu is available on the lower left of your screen. When you want to make intervention, kindly click Request to Speak button. When the chair calls on you to take the floor, the microphone and camera icons will turn into red. Please click and mute the microphone and turn on the video and deliver your intervention. Do not click done speaking until you have completed your intervention as this will cancel your request. Once you have completed your intervention, kindly click done speaking. For technical issues related to KUDO, kindly click technical support tab under the messaging icon and type your message there. Our technician will assist you shortly. The Secretariat will be monitoring the messaging in KUDO. However, the Secretariat kindly requests that all substantive questions or intervention to be raised through your delegation by using the request to speak button only. And finally, to prevent echoes and interference, please stay on the original language when you speak and ensure all other devices connected to KUDO in the same room are turned off. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you. Um, distinguished delegates, the meeting is called to order. We shall now take up agenda item three vitalizing innovative financing and digital financing strategies in support of sustainable development goals. The committee document 
hcap slash cmps slash 2021 slash two has been shared in advance to inform the deliberation on this topic by the committee. The deliberation will be divided into three segments, a concise introduction of the agenda item by the secretariat, followed by an informative panel discussion, a third segment dedicated to formal statement by delegations and statements from other registered participants at this meeting. And also, may I now invite the Secretariat to introduce the agenda item. It is my pleasure to give the floor to Mr. Hamza Ali Malik, Director, Macroeconomic Policy and Financing for Development Division, and introduce the agenda item three. Mr. Malik, please. Thank you, Chair. Honorable Chair, Vice Chairs, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates. Without enhancing the availability of financial resources, improving the alignment of public and private investments with the 2030 agenda, and fully leveraging the potential of digital technologies, ensuring a sustained economic recovery will remain demanding and achievement of SDGs will remain elusive. With this basic point, a basic fact in view, the document SCAP slash CMPF slash 2021 slash 2 discusses selective, se selected innovative and digital financing strategies that have the potential to address such challenges and close the financing gaps. Examples include thematic bonds, such as green bonds, and the adoption of frameworks and standards, and the strengthening of technical and institutional capacities that such bonds would necessitate. Climate risk disclosure and reporting, which can serve as an important means to move towards a green financial system that can better support climate action. Debt for climate swaps that can ease debt distress and support green development. And strengthening of digital payment systems to maximize their benefits for the sustainable development goals. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, only last week on 12th October 2021, we published the 2021 issue of ASCAP's Financing for Development Series number four, titled Financing the SDGs to Build Back Better from the COVID-19 Pandemic in Asia and the Pacific. The report contains a rich analysis of innovative and digital financing strategies that are summarized in this document under consideration today. I encourage distinguished delegates to have a look at the report and share it with pertinent ministries in your respective countries. We have prepared a short information note also, ASCAP slash CMPF slash 2021 slash INF slash two, that summarizes the main messages of this report, along with other recent related activities of the Secretariat on the subject. I invite the committee members to discuss the relevance of the innovative financing strategies discussed in the document and identify policy actions that can help to maximize their potential benefits, including through regional cooperation. The committee may also wish to provide guidance to the Secretariat on how it can support member states through technical assistance programs aimed at building national capacities to facilitate the implementation of such strategies. I look forward to an engaging, dis uh, engaging discussion. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Malik. I would now like to give the floor to Mr. Alberto Iscat, Acting Chief of the Financing for Development Section, to moderate the panel discussion. Mr. Iscat, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chair. Today, we are really delighted. We have uh, within, uh, with us four very knowledgeable and distinguished uh, panelists who will share their perspectives on the opportunities arising from innovative financing and digital financial, uh, financing strategies to support the sustainable development goals. Let me quickly introduce the panelists. We first have Mr. Hiro Mizuno. He is the current uh, envoy, special envoy of the UN Secretary General on Innovative Finance and Sustainable Investment. He was previously the Executive Management Director and CIO of the GPIF, or the Government Pension Investment Fund of Japan. We also have Her Excellency Madame Niev Chantana, 
who is the deputy governor of the National Bank of Cambodia since 2004. She has vast experience in policy making and regulatory issues. Then we have uh, Mr. Parok Uhutta Charon, who is the senior expert in board market development at the Public Debt Management Office of the Ministry of Finance of Thailand. And finally, we have Mr. Apenisa Tuikakao, who is the manager of domestic markets at the Reserve Bank of Fiji. Without further ado, let's move on to the discussion. Before starting, I would like to kindly remind the panelists that we have only 30 minutes, actually, maybe a little less, because we are running out of, uh, out of time. Uh, so please uh, try to limit your intervention to five minutes. Thank you so much for that. Let me start now with uh, Mr. Misuno. Uh, Mr. Misuno, you had vast experience as CIO of GPIF in uh, managing a very large portfolio, and you were a pioneer in the ESG considerations in investment. Actually, you follow the, uh, the principles of responsible investment, which was probably a first for a large uh, institutional, invest, uh, invest, um, institutional investor like GPIF. Uh, my question is very, very simple. Uh, you have vast experience as a finance professional and uh, you know a lot about ESG investments. There is a lot of interest um, in our region by governments in trying to tap these markets to finance uh, the SDGs and the climate action work. So what advice could you give uh, governments in the region to, to be able to access this market? The floor is yours, uh, Mr. Misuno. Yeah, thanks, moderator, and thanks, Mr. Chair, and also the I thank uh, for inviting me to this uh, you know discussion, and uh, I congratulate for SCAP for a successful uh, convening uh, this meeting. So, well, I'm yeah. I've been promoting ESG in the industry, you know, the financial industry, from stock investors to bond investor and also the other uh, bank lending and also the uh, the multilateral development bank uh, financing the uh, sustainable development of both developed countries and also the uh, developing countries and uh, when I started six years ago ESG is still a little sheet in the finance industry but uh, now ESG became mainstream uh, in any asset classes starting from, as I said, uh, public equity to uh, real estate, now, uh, you know, the infrastructure. So every single financial or investment opportunities where, you know, the where investor or financier like a bank discuss, they always wanted to look at the opportunity or risks from the ESG perspective. So I think the amount of the, the, uh, the, uh, the asset uh, being committed to ESG integration now reaching uh, 40 trillion dollars this year and uh, about 40 percent of the uh, the asset under the management globally is now regarded themselves as the uh, the uh, ESG uh, investment so uh, you have to actually uh, uh, present the opportunity to uh, institutional investors or like a financiers as a ESG compliant opportunities so let me give an example uh, when, you know, the, uh, the developing country has a choices of like, you know, coal fire to renewable energy or something like that. Uh, very traditional, uh, the conversation or conventional conversation uh, that happened between the developing countries and the financiers was uh, on one side talking about the, you know, the cheaper and the more readily available technologies and the investors or, or provider of those infrastructure kind of take it for granted by you know the making that market uh for their very lucrative and the cash you know cash rich uh, investment opportunities so i think we need to change it because the more investor concern about esg if the opportunity is not blind to esg uh requirement you won't get that money but if you look at that from the different perspective if you can present your project or your infrastructure whatever the opportunity as an esg compliant uh, opportunities it will invite a lot of the potential investors so if you have choices of obsolete technology and a new technology i always uh, you know the advice the developing countries should ask for the state of the art technology and maybe the gross price tag appear to be more expensive, but 
as more investors is looking for those ESG compliant opportunity through green bond or SDGs bond, there are a lot of new tools becoming available. So if you are more ambitious about the cleaner and a sustainable, more sustainable uh, project or infrastructure, you actually attract more, you know, the bigger group of investors. And uh, even the price tag looks uh, appear to be higher. The gap in the financial cost should compensate, you know, the uh, should uh, become the trade off so that the, you can get the better package. And obviously, you don't need to suffer from, uh, you know, the uh, stranded asset into the future. So, my advice is ESG investor will continue to become mainstream, and then anything non compliant with the ESG requirement will fend off the, uh, the investors. Uh, and also, if you are compliant, and make a more disclosure, it will attract a much bigger base of investors or financier uh, into your country and your economy. So that's my advice. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing the, uh, the more developing countries, uh, you know, the offer the opportunity to those ESG investors and the chance opportunity is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mizuno. I think it's a very interesting piece of advice. It's not just about the financial instruments, but what you're going to finance with them, right? And the ESG compliance seems to be an excellent idea. Um, I'm going now to move to the next, uh, our next panelist, um, uh, excellent Madame Chantana. Um, as you, uh, if you have seen the background document, you know, there, are, uh, there is um, an agenda uh, to enhance access to digital financing in Asia and the Pacific. And this agenda is based on three pillars. One is infrastructure, the second is regulation, and the third one is education programs designed to support the digital economy. Uh, the National Bank of Cambodia has been, of course, is a regulator and, uh, of course, has a lot of experience in regulating the digital uh, finance uh, space. But in addition, uh, it has been a pioneer in providing uh, digital education, uh, sorry, financia, uh, financial education. It has a very interesting program. So perhaps you can tell us in a, in a very brief uh, uh, form, uh, first of all, what are the main challenges that you see as a regulator to ensure that the eruption of uh, these new technologies, the digital financing, does not create uh, problems for the monetary policy or for, for, different, you know, for, the, uh, for the regulatory functions of the central bank? And second, if you can tell us very briefly about the program that the National Bank of Cambodia has on uh, financial education. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Please, um, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, moderator. Um, it is my pleasure to participate in this uh, discussion on the important topic of innovation and digital finance. And thank you for those two questions. I just want to highlight that um, it has been almost two years since the COVID-19 pandemic has caused significant disruption to sustain economic recovery and achieve sustainable development goals. With no exception, social economic system of Cambodia has been substantially impacted by the pandemic. However, in the bright side, the COVID-19 situation prompted accelerated adoption technology and a rapid implementation for cost-effective and easy to access digital banking for financial excluded pop populations. While prioritizing the economic recovery from the pandemic, innovative financing strategy and mechanism remain critical for the recovery process, as well as effective pursuing of SDGs. As a regulator, investment in SDG is proved to have economic benefits in such a way that it could open up market opportunities, create new jobs, and promote the climate change action that will result in expenditure saving. Also, we believe that the fintech development and its growing adoption will significantly contribute to promote financial inclusion, enhance the competitive capability of financial institutions in the market, especially through the introduction of innovative payment services and instruments in the financial system that is still underdeveloped. So to align with the Cambodian digital economy and society policy framework, 
2021 and 2030, the NBC has spent a great effort in promoting the fintech in order to support it. the overarching government's objective on digital economy through modernized digital payment. As an example, more electronic payments such as the standard QR code and the back home system based on blockchain technology has been introduced. Its roles have expanded over time and actively contributed to facilitate and reduce the cost of payment and transfers that support financial and economic transactions. So the fintech and regulatory challenges. However, while promoting the fintech, there, has, there may be a potential risk and issue brought to the financial system and its customer along with its development. Therefore, as a regulator, we need to take into account the balance between innovation and stability. So let me give you a few of my observations on the challenges we are facing in a journey to fintech development. The evolving fintech and its accelerating adoption in banking services, especially in payments, remittance and credit, have outstripped the current regulatory framework, which make it unable to adequately address some of the key aspects related to fintech activities. The absence of regulation and framework with regard to some areas such as digital lending, digital identity, open banking, data protection, and cyber security is considered as the key barriers to promote fintech activity. Also, this area needs a lot of expertise and skills. This limit the level of financial and digital literacy also make it challenging in promoting and accepting the innovative digital banking services which have directed impact on digital adoption in the sector. To address these challenges, the National Bank Cambodia sees it important to promote innovation and the entire digital ecosystem framework and adoption of new technology in the financial sector. This may include development, enabling and implementation of digital policies digital ID, data pooling, and data sharing, cloud computing, EKYC, and other key infrastructures. We acknowledge the need to further promote it, a conducive regulatory environment for fintech application. Our approach is to a sort of watch, learn, apply, approach to promote fintech adoption in both scale and scope within Cambodia. In practice, we are broadly receptive to innovation and necessary development in pursuit to promoting digital finance. We allow the idea to grow within our monitoring. We have worked with respective respective association and working group to better understand the background and motivation of any emerging innovation. Our banking and financial system have been quite stable and resilient in which it made a conducive environment for fintech development and adoption easier and faster. Also, other important digital demographics, such as internet users, with roughly 9.7 million users, over 16.6 million population. Mobile connection, with 20.8 million subscribed subscriptions, with almost 124% of the population. And young population, about 65% of the population, play their key roles in supporting digitization journeys as well. So with regard to the digital, digital financial literacy efforts, nevertheless, the National Bank Cambodia has a, a dedicated a great effort on financial and digital literacy agenda. We believe that financial inclusion cannot be realized unless our population is financially literate. Our ultimate objective is not only to provide information about the financial services and products, but also to equip our people with necessary financial decision-making capacity. We have started our financial literacy journey ranging from campaigning-oriented objectives to a more strategic goal. We have developed various educational materials and channels for the public to get access to financial education. As an example, we have integrated financial education into the national curriculum. We think that this approach is providing a long-term and sustainable impact for our next generation, particularly for the early childhood education. 
Also, we have enhanced digital components in our financial education agenda as well. We have conducted digital financial training with our focus group of women entrepreneurs. We have developed our financial education materials catering toward digital application. For instance, we have created NBC and EDU application that can be used as a platform for public to get access to financial education, educational materials. In addition to our internal effort, we also have a regional cooperation on digital financial literacy with our ASEAN member countries to focus on more strategic direction. As part of the ASEAN Financial Inclusion Working Group, we are deepening the work on digital financial literacy framework in order to create a regional platform for promoting and disseminating of knowledge and capacity building on DFR and provide guidelines on collection of DFR data, promoted innovation in DFR as well. So to conclude, to summarize, the National Bank Cambodia has been at the forefront of fintech development and adoption, given its important and vital role in supporting our financial inclusion agenda. With the COVID-19 situation, the topic of digitization has been increased its precedence. And this is so true, especially during the phase of recovery and rebuild our society and economic activity in which we have an opportunity to make them more resilient, sustainable and innovative. Going forward, we are looking to work collaboratively with key stakeholders to enhance our recovery process and in the area of developing innovative financing instruments, particularly sustainable bond and other thematic bonds that can be also support the sustainability and SDG goals. We are looking forward to enhance our work on digital financial literacy to keep pace with our fintech development and protected our financial consumers. Through this journey, I also would like to thank the UNS CAP who has been supporting us with the area of digital financial literacy, especially focusing on women entrepreneurs. So hopefully we can expand our collaboration in these existing areas and beyond. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Excellency. Thank you for a very interesting uh, intervention. Uh, I, would, I think one important point you mentioned is that uh, there cannot be financial inclusion without financial literacy. That's an excellent point. And I also would like to add that uh, financial literacy is also important as a complement to regulation because some of the issues that uh, central banks need to regulate is to avoid you know, instances of fraud or you know, pyramid schemes and things like that. And when the public is, uh, you know, is understand these issues, they are less likely to, to fall you know, in this type of of, you know, situations. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to move to the next speaker. Thank you. Uh, we have Mr. Uh, uh, Parok uh, Utacharom. I would like to, to turn to you the, uh, the attention of this uh, panel to another important topic uh, covering the agenda item, which is innovative financing, financing mechanisms to support the achievement of the SDGs. In 2020 and 2021, Thailand raised around $4 billion um, in, so in a, uh, through, any, through various issuance of sustainability bonds. Uh, I was also the first sovereign country to issue a sustainability bond. The bond is also listed in the Luxembourg Stock Exchange. Can you walk us very briefly through the challenges encountered in the pre-issuance and provide advice to other countries that may be thinking of issuing sim similar sustainability bonds? The floor is yours. Hi. Um First of all, um, th thank you, um, UNSCAP, for the invitation um, for me to, to speak at this panel today. Uh, first of all, I'd like to just maybe uh, give, give, give you a brief overview of, of our sustainability bond. Um, I think the, the idea, um, you know, because we, we are a, um, an office that uh, raise funds for the government, uh, whether to finance budget deficit for COVID financing for infrastructure investment. Um, and we issue a lot of bonds um, annually. Um, but um, last year, um, I think we, we came up with a, we a commitment um, to issue our first sustainability bond, including both green and social. Um, and the idea was that um, I think we, we needed to, um, Ministry of Finance needed to support um, the government 
um, in, in, in our efforts in uh, addressing the issue of climate change and social issues, whether it's um, you know, equality or increasing employment for all income groups. Um, and the government also, I think our finance minister mentioned earlier in his remarks about the uh, bio, um, circular and green economic model. Um, we want to be um, growing in a more sustainable, inclusive and uh, environment friendly um, going forward. Um, and also support UN SDG and also do our part um, with the national community in moving towards the Paris Agreement um, target. Um, so um, doing a uh, EST bond requires a little bit more effort. Um, there are more steps involved um, in terms of um, getting ready for the bond. Um, the first thing we, we did was uh, we had to come up with a framework, um, the first Kingdom of Thailand sustainable framework. Um, of course, we, we look at other countries' examples, other sovereigns that have done it before. Um, and we also, we, we engage with, uh, you know, arrangers, um, banks to, to help out, um, both local and national banks. And of course, you know, other stakeholders, ADB, World Bank, have been a great help as well um, in terms of getting the, um, the framework right. Because we wanted to make sure that um, we meet all the standards for green and social bond issuance, whether it's EGMA standards, ASEAN standards. Um, and we had our framework um, verified by a third party, which is Center Analytics. Um, and then the framework um, had to include all of the um, criteria required. For example, the framework includes, um, you know, the categories of, of all the sectors that can be included in into um, the financing. Um, we decided to uh, go with green and social um, because we look at, um, you know, issues like, you know, Thailand is located at the uh, area where we are quite prone to national disasters, you know, arising from climate change, flood droughts. Our economy is also rely heavily on, on you know, agriculture and tourism in, in coastal areas. Um, so I think, um, you know, addressing climate change issues is, is, a, is a huge part of what we need to do. Uh, so the green projects includes, you know, electricity, en clean energy, mass transit, clean transportation, uh, water resource management, as well as, um, you know, marine biodiversity, natural resources, conservation. Uh, for the social projects, um, you know, we, we think that, um, you know, social issues and climate change issues are actually quite um, closely linked. You know, people in low income areas, you know, uh, recover more, you know, uh, harder from, from, from flood or droughts. Um, you know, so that could actually further worsen inequality. Um, so social, social projects include anything from accessibility to, you know, basic needs, housing, electricity, water, um, also also includes COVID relief packages, um, and also um, you know access to credit for small SMEs as well. Other part of the framework includes um, uh, monitoring of uh, making sure that the money goes to the right place, just ensuring transparency. Um, we have uh, reporting regularly, annually. The report is helped um, by ADB and also uh, external review by another third party. Um, DMV. Um, we also have a committee, cross-agency committee, um, which is a key part of the challenges that we face. Uh, we have to make sure that, you know, all the line ministries who are already do, actually doing good work on, on the projects for green, um, but um, for the green financing, we need them on board as well. So we have um, representative from, you know, line ministries, from natural resource, from NESDC, and also from the market, um, you know, Security Exchange Commission, um, as well. So I think going forward, um, this will help a lot in terms of selecting the right projects for future um, green financing and social financing. Um, the next step was the, um, the bond assurance. So, you know, we go through all the roadshows, making sure the investor knows what, what we're doing um, to further promote um, our course and also um, just explain to them what, what, why we're doing this and uh, um, and then I think our, our first auction this syndicate uh, was in August last year, well received by investors from local and national investors. Um, we had about 16 to 20% from international investors, which is quite good. And also local investor 
from banks all the way to you know long term it's like life insurance um in a way we we sacrifice one of our major tenor 15 year tenor for entirely for the esg to promote liquidity um and also um to further raise awareness with um for other to join like soes and private sector um you know we we flirt, we listed in the luxembourg stock exchange um just to uh, raise awareness internationally uh, for more interest into our bond um, and also climate bond initiative as well um, they actually approved and certified our green portion um, so that you know further underscore um, the, the transparency and that our bond is in line with national standard um, looking forward i think we we want to continue to actually we already committed uh, this fiscal year to almost double and the size of our current um, ESG tenor. We, looked, we are looking to, to expand to other sectors as well, uh, with the green projects, and we are working with the Limeage to do that. Um, so um, I think I, I would encourage any other issuer who uh, um, considering, I think it's, it's been a very worthwhile and rewarding process for us. Um, and I think it's a duty for the government to actually really get into this um, to make sure that um, we, we encourage other people to join as well. I think we just wanted to do what we can, as much as we can, uh, to support the climate change and, and social issues. Um, that's, that's all from me, and thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Kumparot. Very, very interesting again. Um, I think that, uh, well, Thailand is really giving an example that many countries, in many developing countries, probably could, could learn from it. Um, I think that one important issue of these uh, sustainability bonds is that uh, not only you are gathering finance that is necessary now at the time of the recovery from COVID, but this is finance that goes to, you know, to building back better, as we call it in the UN. So I think it uh, seems to be a very good instrument. Uh, another interesting thing is that you are not not only relying on international investors, but you know, probably the bulk is domestic investors, which is also a, a very important you know, research recommendation that we have made in our report uh, this year. Okay, so let me please move to the next one. Uh, Mr. Uh, Apenisa Tuikakao. In 2017, Fiji became the first sovereign to issue a green bond with all issuances oversubscribed. Now, four years later, can you tell us how the bond issuance has supported environmental outcomes in Fiji? Also, what advice would you provide to countries, particularly island nations, who may be thinking in issuing in a green bond? The floor is yours, sir. Mr. Abenisa. Thank you for the warm welcome, uh, moderator. I appreciate the opportunity to participate on this panel today. Mr. Chair, Excellencies, distinguished delegates and participants, a good afternoon to you all. Let me begin by saying that climate change is a national priority in Fiji, and uh, we have taken a proactive approach to identify and strategize on how we can meet our development and climate targets in order to build res resilience. In Fiji, we have witnessed with our own eyes the eroding of shorelines in riverbanks, increasing severe natural disaster events, including cyclones, and increasing ocean acidification, saltwater indonization, and the changes in the predictability and intensity of rainfall. And these changes have profound impact on many sectors of the economy at large, in particular agriculture, the blue economy, and uh, policy and governance, so it's really the whole economy at large. And given our cultural sector setting, the impact weighs unfairly towards the vulnerable community, in particular women, due to the reduction in food sources, the increasing outbreak of vector-borne diseases, and at times they have been forced to help with the relocation of homes and dwellings due to cyclones or coastal erosion. Since then, we have pushed forward an urgent need to address climate change at the international level. While at home, we continue to build our resilience against these disasters. And to do this, our government has invested heavily for the future by building resilient infrastructure and promoting sustainable development. In terms of finance, the immense amount of capital required to wholly meet Fiji's climate resilient development needs is far greater than the level of domestic and the international climate finance that we can attract. And this provides the motivation behind the issuance of Green Bond in 2017, which was to explore the power of capital markets to provide funds 
It's about projects that are sustainable, respect the environment, and address impacts of climate change. Now, one of the key elements of our uh, green bond framework is to ensure that we have a sound impact monitoring procedure and template to report on the use of funds again the expected socioeconomic benefits. This is key for our stakeholders so that they can get to know the mechanism involved and ultimately ensure that uh, utmost transparency and handling on the use of green bond proceed. Since we've last issued in the, the year 2017-2018, we have continually report back to our investors and the public at large for the last three years through the Fiji Green Bond update report. So it's an annual report that we release uh, every year. And we use uh, the latest uh, census data available in some form of model to gauge our benchmark. When we started the uh, lining of projects, there were 31 projects that were eligible, but because of the uh, uh, shortage of funds, we have to strictly uh, narrow down the projects in only for only seven categories. And uh, these are they were divided into four adaptation and three mitigation projects. Now, a key challenge which can be unique for each country is to strike the right balance between uh, climate mitigation and adaptation. And regardless of the mitigation efforts by the rest of the world, our adaptation Fiji needs in Fiji is enlarging due to the scale of vulnerability. And uh, out of all the, we raised about Fiji, Fiji 100 million in green bond and 91% of funds raised have been used for adaptation while only 9% for um, mitigation. And uh, you know, one of the beauty of green bond comes in because we, we're able to attract private sector funds to areas that they don't really invest on, which is on adaptation project. And this is because you know we it's hard to create a business case for adaptation project due to the challenges in pricing benefit pricing the benefits and uncertainty of a large such investment. So, four years since we last issued, uh, I'll just go over some uh, uh, of the um, outcomes. Close to half of the funds we raised from the green bond proceeds were used to rehabilitate and uh, construct schools in the aftermath of TC uh, Winston, which damaged more than 200 schools. Many Fijian children were left without access to education and conducive learning environment. We're happy to report that through the use of green bond proceeds, many of these schools have been rebuilt. And this also includes dormitory, evolution block, dining hall, and a total of 33, 209 uh, um, school children have uh, regained full access to school curriculum. And, not, and we're not just rebuilding, but ensuring that school infrastructure are climate resilient, which can also be used for evacuation centers during disasters. So we can imagine without the green bond proceeds, uh, many of our school children may not have, may, may have not regained access to education services yet. Emergency work, the use of green bond proceeds also help in immediate and temporary restoration of works following major events such as uh, restor restoring affected roads, bridges, road slips following soil erosion. Such disruptions have significantly halted business activities for days or weeks because forms of transportation are inaccessible and emergency remedial works are critical during such time to minimize supply disruption and you know, to ensure the flow of economic activity continues and enable communities affected by natural disasters to receive emergency assistance and be rehabilitated quickly. In other words, the use of uh, green bond funds have brought calm and normalcy quickly to the affected communities during natural disasters. And uh, there were more than 1,000 roads, affected roads that were restored, um, close to 200 bridges that were damaged had the access restored. And one affected jetty, which is a point of transportation access to one of our major islands, was also restored. On access to water, certain rural and urban areas throughout Fiji continue to face irregular or no water supply during water shortages, droughts, and heavy peak usage. 
rural communities that depend on rivers, streams, and unsafe sources of water are the most vulnerable to climate-induced waterborne diseases, particularly in the aftermath of uh, climate adversities. We have uh, enhanced access to treated water and environmentally friendly waste water disposal for the communities. These communities are either far away from a reliable water source or cannot be connected economically uh, to the natural water irrigation system. Thanks to Greenborn, more communities are now less prone to disease and germs and are more productive and productivity will increase as there's no need, now, now there's no need to fetch water from somewhere else. There are many other benefits which I cannot cover due to time constraint, but overall, I want to make it clear that the issuance of uh, the first ever sovereign green bond in Fiji has helped encourage the unprecedented private sector climate finance, expedite climate action at the national and local level, and ensure fiscal stability. But in terms of lessons for the other countries, I want to say that alongside many other countries that have issued green bond, we also have set the foundation for future capital market investment in climate change by not only government, but also the private sector or in particular large firms as well. It is a win-win outcome for countries and investors in adapting to the serious effects of climate change must have a strong and con consistent political will to address climate change and through the, our experience this has allowed the Fijian government to choose an uh, innovative approach to raising climate finance. Consultation and active engagement is key with investors. In Fiji the RBF was instrumental in ensuring that market awareness and interest was generated for every tranche that was issued and uh, before the issuance we already gained some interest on uh, you know the variety or the extent of uh, investment that will be on the market. Countries may also consider collaborating with development partners for technical assistance, as issuing green bond for the first time is not easy. As in our case, we are grateful for the technical assistance provided by the IFC. And uh, just uh, finally, I would like to uh, say that you know with a remarkable interest domestically and also from uh, international investors, we want to maintain the momentum on climate action and sustainable development. And we're working with other development partners, in particular the UK government, on more innovative ways of climate financing. And uh, we will be using the lessons we gained from uh, the issuance of uh, Fiji Green Bonds as a benchmark or guiding tool as we dive deeper into the climate financing ecosystem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Penisa. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time. So I will, uh, I will close now this panel discussion and ask the chair to continue with the proceedings. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Isgat, for moderating the panel and thank you to the distinguished panelists for your valuable contributions to our deliberation on this agenda item. I would now like to open the floor to statements from delegation. As we only have limited time, may I ask our delegation again to kindly keep your statements within four minutes. For your information, the speaker order will be statements from SCAP member states, followed by associate members, permanent observers, followed by statements from this designated representatives of UN bodies and specialized agency and international governmental organizations, and followed by statements from representatives of non-governmental organizations, if time permits. <coughs> statements will be read in or order in which they have been received by the conference officer or show up in the request to speak list. So I would like to invite the first speakers on the list, the distinguished delegation from Japan. Please take the floor.
thank you, Chair, uh, for giving me a floor. And uh, uh, I also thank you for the insightful panel discussion. And uh, we, we really appreciate for every speakers uh, for uh, useful input to, uh, to that issue. Uh, I would like to share uh, a few uh, undertakings on this uh, item three. Uh, first, uh, with regard to thematic bond, uh, we are aware that uh, the Bank of Japan will carry out climate change related operations targeting green bond within, within this year. The Bank of Japan will expand its investment in green bond as part of a joint effort among Asian central banks to promote the region's bond market. Regarding the digitalization of the public sector, we would like to share Japan's latest under undertakings. As a COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the necessity of the digitalization of our society, the digital agency was established on September 1st this year to contribute to reforming the culture of administration in a user-driven manner through the digitalization. As concrete initiative of the digitalization of the public sector, the government of Japan launched in 2018 the Giga School Program to ensure one device for one student with a high-speed network in school, which brings optimized and creative learning to all students. In the medical sphere, there are ongoing efforts to promote online diagnosis. I hope that we would share lesson learned and expertise from these undertakings in the year to come to Asia and the Pacific region bilaterally or international or through international organization, including SCAP. Thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, thank you, Delegate from Japan. Now I would like to invite Delegate from China to uh, give the country statement. So the floor is for you. Delegate from China, are you there? There seems to be a technical issue with the Chinese delegate. Just wait for a moment, please. Mr. Chair, can you see me and hear me? Mr. Chair, can you see me? Yeah, yeah, yes. Okay, I can see you. Okay, I would like to deliver my intervention in Chinese. Yeah. Yes, please. Yes,代表,新冠肺炎疫情严重冲击世界经济。巨大财政和资金压力发展筹资是落实2030年可持续发展议程的关键也是抗击疫情和疫后重建的保障亚太国家应切实执行亚迪斯亚贝巴行动议程 
，践行真正的多边主义，深化全球发展伙伴关系，加大发展筹资力度，增加发展资源，强化发展机构职能，着力解决发展中国家发展关切。各方应发挥南北合作主渠道作用，发达国家应兑现官方发展援助承诺。确保发展中国家获得有保障、可预期的资金流，推动本地区尽快战胜疫情，更好落实减贫等可持续发展目标。我们也应继续推进南南合作。中方已宣布，未来三年内再提供三十亿美元国际援助，用于支持发展中国家抗疫和恢复经济社会发展。主席先生。在新一轮科技革命和产业背变革的背景下，亚太地区数字经济蓬勃发展，疫情进一步催化各国数字经济数呃各国经济社会数字化转型。亚太国家应牢牢把握数字红利，加强数字经济领域务实合作。中方愿同 SGAP 各成员一道努力，共同推进亚太信息高速公路倡议的落实。促进各国数字基础设施互联互通，弥合数字鸿沟。各方应充分发挥数字筹资在促进本地区发展筹资中的积极作用，拓宽融资渠道，挖掘疫后经济复苏新动能。谢谢。Thank you very much,、uh, delegate from China, for your country statement. So,、uh, because、uh, we are running our time now, and、um, we would like to uh, continue uh, our country statement tomorrow at ten、uh, o'clock. So, I would like to thank、um, delegates,、uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, for your、uh, participation today. Thank you. Is there any announcements,、uh, the secretary?、Uh, thank you, chair.、Uh, I think we've been informed by our、uh, conference management colleagues that、uh, we are out of time、uh, for today, and、uh, we apologize to our delegates and we request them to join us and make the country statements under agenda item three tomorrow. We'll start at ten o'clock. Thank you, chair. For today, I think it's a wrap. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.